This is the Wednesday Well of Being. Really happy to be back here with you all. I've been uh, out and about on retreat, and uh, last week many of us were happily at the Children's Day School to have the author of this incredible book join us. That was just such a treat, huh? Yeah, it was really, yeah, really lovely. Um, so humbling, right, to, to be there in the presence of someone who, at least for me, I feel I've already learned more than I could possibly imagine from this book. It's like, really? There's going to be more? Um, but his embodiment, his laughter, and I feel like his real dedication to reminding us that the goodness is already here was so moving. Like I really felt that invitation to see that, that here is already a source of healing, that here is all is already kind of what we're looking for, like that famous line. And that a lot of what we need to do is kind of release the contraction of feeling as though we are not enough of looking towards and seeking on the outside. This is probably not news to anyone, right? That there's a lot of outward seeking, maybe not enough time really spent in the contentment of our own peace of mind. But his clarity and his specificity to remind us over and over that that's where we need to be, I found so inspiring. And um, yeah, tonight we're going to revisit. So this, if this is your first time here, no problem. We're making our way through this wonderful text of his, which I said last week, and it's true, it's really um, like looks don't reveal. Like this book looks very small, and yet it is so powerful and potent. And even though I read through it in a linear way, I find it most helpful to use in a more circular way, continuing to revisit like the core essence of what he's offering again and again. Um, I think especially the three precious pills. So that's what he invited us to, to practice together last week. And what I'd like us to do this evening is to revisit them. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those, revisit them. And we are going to move towards the air element. So we've already been working with earth, water, fire. Air has its own unique and special quality. So I think we'll probably do a practice with the precious pills, a little discussion, and then a practice inviting this quality of air and reflecting on that as well. Um, before we get started, especially I see some new faces, which is great. So for those of you who are new here today and those of you who come all the time, just a reminder that in order for us to really do the work of learning, growing, transforming, liberating, you know, we can have aspirations. We need to do so in this community that is constellated in a different way every week. Like every week we come together and have this opportunity to build a community that is a compassionate community. We could all go home and read this book by ourselves, and it would be of great benefit. We can meditate on our own so ardently and it would be of great benefit. But when we're in community or kind of manifesting or embodying the teachings in a very different way. Not always easy. Other people, they breathe weird, you know, they make noise, they're like all this awkwardness. And yet, like there is such a power of recognizing that all of us, we kind of share these really simple aspirations. We want to be more free of what makes us feel crazy. Come on in anywhere, it's fine. We all want to be, you know, feeling a sense of belonging to ourselves and others. We want to feel connected to ease, peace of mind. And so when we practice in community, we have that opportunity. But unfortunately, when we practice in community, we also get to work with one of the wonderful hindrances, which is judgment, judgment of ourself, judgment of others. So my, my hope whenever we come together to practice is that we can take a small vow, if only if it feels comfortable. And that is to be as kind as imaginable in your body, your speech, and your mind for the time of our session together. So when the thought arises of, I don't understand this, I don't like this, I'm doing this wrong, 
just like as though you could wrap it in this sweet little lotus flower of kindness. You're like, it's okay, not a problem. Or if someone, you know, is breathing that funny way, or if like the Harleys go by with Santana, like mm -hmm. that's okay, you know, no problem. So that's our goal. And, and to do so again, not just in what we say, that's kind of easy. Most of us have learned if we've made it this far in life, how to not say stuff that is unkind unless we're really provoked but can we get there at the level of like the inner speech and the thoughts and to have a whole posture internally of kindness towards what we're experiencing what we're approaching so what do you think sound like an okay idea okay we'll give it a try worth a try right so um in our wednesday nights i hear you know i'm in the front of the room offering teachings and guiding us but there is a lot of, or, and there is a lot of discussion. So it's not just me asking you to not judge me. I'd love that. Mm -hmm. um, but really, you know, in our discussion and conversation and sharing, it's of utmost importance. Yeah, so, and here at the Dharma Collective, you know, we're always looking for ways to improve this space and to make it feel more easeful, make it feel like it is a place you want to show up and, um, share. So if you have suggestions for us, we'd love that. You can write them down, you can email us. And, you know, some folks have shared really meaningful things just in terms of, I don't love being so close in these chairs, right? It's tight. So you can unhook the chairs, give yourself space if that feels more comfortable. And also, you know, it's really nice just to know the format. I think some people feel a lot more at ease when they know what's going to happen. So I, unfortunately, am going to continue talking a bit longer. Then we are going to do some closed eyes meditation practice, some discussion, and one more practice, maybe some more discussion. And we have amazing mace at the door so we can feel at ease, that we can relax and fully arrive here and be together. And we also have, uh, I'd say, the, the steadfastness, the trustworthiness of these teachings of Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, who's a teacher really has dedicated so much of his life to practice. Uh, Rinpoche is an honorific term, meaning that he's identified as an incarnation of um, someone who has come through an unbroken lineage of teachings in Tibet, specifically in the Bon tradition. But he's also a Geshe, uh, which is like if you did a PhD times a PhD. Like real glutton for punishment. I did one of those. It was enough, right? Not a Geshe, just a PhD. He just went hard core into the deep scholarship and study. And so I just feel um, that what we, are, what we are guided in through what he's offering is the most simple distillation of such complexity. So we're in very good hands with him. So before we get into a bit more of the discussion, uh, we just settle in maybe five minutes of arriving here more fully. And it's so helpful to really consider the posture, be gentle with the body and also invite a sense of uprightness, dignity. So maybe the gentleness comes through softening the eyes And softening the cheekbones and the jaw. Feel and imagine a softening through the chest, the abdomen. And finding a place where the hands feel at ease that could be folded in the lap or resting on the thighs. And let every part of your posture be intentional. So noticing and connecting to wherever the feet are touching the floor. Mm, a sense of how the shoulders are hanging. Classic instruction is to have a bit of openness in the chest, which could mean that the shoulders just barely point backwards, almost as though those shoulder blades were coming together to touch. Mm. 
as we invite our attention and awareness more fully here in this present moment. Let's see if we can connect to the sense of space and time. Really feeling the sense for those of us in the room of being here in the heart of the mission in San Francisco. And for friends at home, really, even if it's the same room you've been in all day, all year, so familiar, getting a sense of place. And connecting to the season in this moment. Here on Folsom Street, the trees are all fully green once again, return of spring. There's still daylight, even with our overcast clouds and skies here. And situating ourselves right within this, this body, this breath, this place, this moment. And we'll lengthen the next couple inhales and consider extending even longer the exhales. So slowly drawing in through the nostrils, and gently opening the mouth and exhaling. Twice more, inhaling slowly. And exhale. Once more. Return to the natural rhythm of the breath. See if you can saturate all of your attention and awareness with the breath. Considering this possibility that following our breath could be the most important thing that we are learning to do today. Of course, there's distractions and thoughts, memories, images, sounds, sensations. But for a couple more moments, really putting our full attention and awareness with the breath, choosing, preferring to just rest our attention here.
and feeling a sense of all of us breathing here together. And considering the shared intention of practicing, dedicating our hearts and minds towards change, openness, softening, in order for us to show up and be more present with what matters in our life. And to be more of service. And to support this world that so badly needs our support, our full heart, our full mind. When I ring the bell, seeing if you can still maintain and sustain a sense of presence with the breath and the body, even as we re-engage with the room, one another, the teachings. Thank you all, welcome again. Maybe a little bit more here. That's nice. So some folks who've been coming a while, we really developed this relationship with these three precious pills, the stillness, the silence, the openness and warmth. But even if that's the first time you're hearing it, isn't that appealing? Stillness silence, openness, warmth, and not as something we need to go out and seek, but something that we can really find and forge internally as our true refuge. And it's really beautiful the way that, you know, he calls these, these three precious pills. And last week, he often was describing it as these three doorways. And where does it lead to? Like the space that we're always looking for, right? Like just somewhere where I can rest, somewhere where it's easeful, somewhere where I feel good, connected. It's like, these are your doorways. You know, the pill in our contemporary culture, you know, we all want a pill. <laughs> I want to tell you all, many of us would like a pill to resolve all our ills. And so I do like that he uses that metaphor of medicine. And very often Buddha has kind of described as, you know, the doctor, right? the one who can really attend to what ails us to really meet suffering. But I also like this, day, this idea of a doorway, because when we practice with stillness, it can feel as though it's leading us somewhere quite different and distinct. <clears throat> we've, we've looked at these three uh, precious pills in, in many different ways, but I wanted to add a layer I haven't before, Maybe I was a little bit hesitant. I really enjoy bringing a, as simple as possible of a Dharma, of a teaching to you all. And yet I'm also aware that sometimes, you know, the sacredness of some of these terms and ideas, even if you don't believe in them or understand them, there's an unlocking, just hearing the words and hearing Rinpoche describe some of that, encourage me to, to share that here with you all. So when we talk about these three, uh, these three precious pills, the first is how do we settle into the body? And we invite this quality of stillness in the body. He says, feeling the stillness and connecting deeply allows you to be fully present. Even when we feel restless or agitated, you can always bring your attention to stillness. You can experience just being. And he says that when we connect with that stillness of the body, what we somewhat paradoxically find is that there is a lot of energy, movement, 
I know from many of you here when we've been practicing together and you can actually really drop into the body without this desire to go anywhere, to move, to do anything, to find that stillness. But what you actually discover is a lot of vitality and energy. Have folks noticed that in their practice? And the way he describes this first inner refuge, this first precious pill is also unbounded sacred space. So this is again, a word, an image, an idea, but this a opportunity to consider that when we focus and settle in the body, what we experience in the mind is openness, a real sense of being unencumbered by so many of the worries and difficulties and contraction that we experience. And he also, and this is what I haven't um, shared before much on, he says that this is the Dharmakaya. And this is a word or a term that has resonance for some people, but it's the body of emptiness. And again, it doesn't, we don't have to go super esoteric and deep, but the Dharmakaya, especially when you start resonating with what that could look like and mean, is to feel this body as more than just the form body, to feel that this body is actually somewhat of a portal to a feeling of consciousness permeating the body and extending beyond the body, unbounded sacred space. So I, I really love the poetry of that. And um, this idea of the body of emptiness an unbounded sacred space, he says it's a natural protection against a lot of our sense of fear and loss. I was re-listening to his talk from last week today, and he says, we are all so busy doing nothing. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't totally agree with that because we all are doing way too many things. But when he says nothing, he means we're not actually moving towards like the deeper essence of who we are. We're not actually connecting to that sense of unbounded sacred space. We're not present with our own consciousness and our own body. We're, we're busy doing all these things on the outside. And just that poetry and that possibility of feeling your own body as a body of emptiness, an unbounded sacred space, just has a, has a beautiful calling. And emptiness, we, we talked about this a lot in the eight months past, or actually, I certainly think it's been a year on the book of uh, the Buddha's uh, biography, Old Path, White Clouds. And this idea of emptiness, not meaning some sort of void or abyss, but this recognition of always changing, always shifting. And that that kind of undulation of energy we feel, that vitality we feel when we close our eyes, we invite stillness in the body, but what we find are kind of these um, amazing uh, coursing sense of subtle energy in the body. And what's that showing us is that the body is always moving, shifting, changing, and quite literally the energies in our body, you know, there's so many processes happening from digestion and homeostasis, always wanting to be sought out through different processes to help us uh, meet the, the hot temperature, the cool temperature, that always changing body is the body of emptiness. It starts to feel less dense, starts to feel less concrete, this body of emptiness. So if it sounds like a bunch of fluffy woo, no problem. If it, found, it sounds like something that might be interesting to kind of look out for, wonderful. Because again, it's just kind of a pointing out towards. Then when we think about moving from the body to the, in, to the speech and silence, which I think is such a, such a tough one, that the second precious pill is finding inner silence. Because what most of us discover when we close our eyes and look inward is not silent, right? Very busy lots of words, lots of ideas, lots of ambition, lots of, you know, recrimination, self-doubt, like so much that comes up in that space. And I love what he said last week, which was in order to prime us of this choice of silence, he said, think about the world out there. It's so loud out there. God, there's so many things going on out there. Now come in here. Isn't it silent and beautiful? 
really treating our awareness, our body like a temple. You know, when you enter the temple and there's the hush, and just that feeling that, you know, this inner silence. And again, this kind of beautiful paradox, we have the stillness of the body and yet so much movement. And then when we turn towards this inner speech, he says, uh, or sorry, this inner silence of our speech, he says that we actually end up, it's like an inner light. And what we experience when we turn towards the silence is actually a sense of brightness. So sometimes we talk here about this beautiful union between spaciousness and awareness. So the spaciousness of the body, feeling that sense of ease, relaxation, that could also lead to dullness, falling asleep. The awareness is like this light within the space, just this vividness within that space. So he describes um, this second inner refuge, this inner pill, this doorway. He says this, this inner light is traditionally referred to as Sambhogakaya, the body of light. He brought this up a lot last week. I don't know if folks picked up on it. This analogy of light is often found in Buddhism, this idea that this is a body of light. We have a body of light. Again, it's a very poetic kind of illustrative term, but we can start to feel and imagine the quality of light in our body. And he described, um, I think Jason asked about the fire element last week, and Rinpoche was describing that the way he understands the fire element is that within us, we can recognize there is inner light. So we look to the fire element to see our own inner light. And he, Rinpoche himself, I think he has maybe one or two dark retreat centers. Some of you may be familiar. These are retreat centers in which you have complete sensory deprivation. So it's dark, there's no sound. There's this really intricate way of getting food and receiving food, but there's no stimulation and you're in for 49 days. Oh, big deal. And he says, no one gets depressed on a dark retreat. You know, it's actually the opposite. Like the light gets a lot stronger internally. Right. So this idea that as we are, you know, first in that preliminary way, finding the stillness and the spaciousness, inviting the calming of the inner speech towards silence. It's not that we find just this kind of absent, dull, mushy, blissy place. It's bright body of light, vivid. So I, I really love that description he offers. And then the, the third, and these, you know, these really, they kind of build or they, they kind of grow out of one another. So you can kind of have a sense with the silence built on the stillness. And then you have this warmth and openness that comes as the third. And this is as we settle our mind into its natural state. And he says, when you're caught up in the stories and dramas of your moving mind, you can always bring attention to the open sky of your mind. It's always there. Feeling and connecting deeply with this spaciousness is an experience of genuine warmth. <clears throat> All that your soul needs to heal exists here in the warmth of being. And he says that this third refuge is what he calls... Um, the third refuge is known as Nirmanakaya, body of manifestation. So it's interesting. Here we start with this body of emptiness, like kind of clearing out, body of light, kind of <clears throat> lifting up or finding what is just this natural, luminous quality of our being. And then we can manifest, then we can like really stabilize and be present within it. But that's through spaciousness and warmth. So if this is, again, if it feels a little complex, no problem. You know, just like I really trust in these words. I trust in these concepts and constructs. I don't think we need to go into deep philosophical treaties on all of them for now. We can, if we want, at another time, go into the kayas, these three bodies. Um, but I really like just the, the simple way that they're described as this body of emptiness, the body of light, and the body of manifestation. So I wanted to share that before we practice with them. And also a reminder of 
why we are practicing, practicing with these three. He says the three precious pills of stillness, silence, and spaciousness can help you connect with the true source of healing within. It may manifest a subtle sense of comfort with who you are, but with this connection, when it's lively, it can bring deep feelings of love and compassion. So instead of needing to generate compassion and love explicitly, just settling in to the stillness, the silence, and the openness right. brings compassion. And I, I think that I think that's true. Bless you. I've naturally experienced that myself. Um, and he says, if this feels out of reach, this compassion, look closer and you'll see that you're not experiencing the first two refuges. So you lack enough openness and awareness for the healing qualities to arise within you. So just really kind of turning towards and noticing where might we not be actually settling into stillness, settling into silence. Um, it's as if your inner space is small and your problems are big. <laughs> so just this need to kind of host our experience. He said this last week, host our experience in something much bigger. So if we host our experience of whatever it is, frustration, disappointment, longing, worry from this kind of contracted lack of space, you know, just kind of like, oh, everything's so hard and bad, makes our problems feel bigger. But if we're, he said, if we're hosting our pain in the stillness, silence, and spaciousness, naturally there's acceptance and caring attention for what's happening. So that's the invitation. So I'd like us to practice with these three precious pills. I might give us a little invitation to air, just looking um, at our time here, and then we'll unpack air a bit more maybe practice with it. For those who haven't uh, been here in, in the weeks before, one of the other parts of the practice that Rinpoche is offering is bringing to mind a quality, a natural essence. So something like earth might have this quality of really being grounded. Water, kind of fluidity, flexibility, the fire, the inspiration and joy. And with air, there's a lot of movement of movement and you know playfulness is what he describes so that's what we'll be calling forth a bit if you want to stretch for a moment you can just stand up move and then we'll be doing a bit of a longer sit <laughs> I feel warm. Anyone else? Nice to see you all. Uh, well, you know, this I'm <laughs> Friends online, can you hear pretty well? Good, nice, nice to see you all. So giving ourselves a moment to reconnect with the posture and to help with that openness of the chest and uprightness of the spine. We can inhale our shoulders up to our ears. 
exhaling them down our back. I'm trying that twice more. And back. One more time. It can be really nice to give ourselves a moment as well to notice where does the spine feel the most balanced and at ease. So we might want to lean forward and lean to the side and back around and really get a sense of where do we feel like that natural uprightness and support. Being considerate with how the head is resting on top of the neck. We want the chin just slightly pointed downwards and the gaze to be soft, either with eyes open or closed. Beginning with the first of these three precious pills, we invite our attention and awareness to the body. We invite the sense of stillness in the body. Not only is the body not moving anywhere, not going anywhere, not doing anything, Feel the stillness, like the quality of a mountain, a stability and presence. And the stillness of the body may help instruct some stillness of the mind. In the same way that maybe we have an impulse to get up and go walk and grab a cup of tea, but we remain sitting. There's an impulse in the mind to get carried away with thoughts and memories or images, but we stay still, fully here in the body. This natural state of the body, of one of deep stillness, Feel and imagine this invitation with the body and the stillness of the body. There's a doorway to unbounded sacred space. But by resting our mind fully here in the stillness of the body, there's an expansion, an opening.
You don't even need to necessarily push away thoughts or distractions. But we just return and preference the full experience of <clears throat> being in the body and feeling this quality of stillness in the body. It can be easy to start to feel a little drowsy or dull. So refresh your interest in the sensations of stillness. What does the body actually feel like experientially, moment by moment, from within the body itself? Not imagining how the body feels, not visualizing. Experiencing, sensing, feeling the body stillness. When you get distracted, see how kind you can be as you return your attention and awareness to the body. And also notice, what is it like to return? Reconnecting with the sensation, being present in the body, and this possibility of the body of unbounded sacred space, Dharmakaya, body of emptiness. From this stillness, it's a natural shift or opening to the opportunity of silence, helping to quiet the inner speech. And to support this experience, we can more closely follow the breath, really noticing the subtle sensations of breath traveling in through the nostrils, and sustaining that close following of breath as we exhale through the nostrils. And of course, there are still sounds on the outside, still thoughts, images, and memories, but we keep turning our preference towards this inner silence this quieting, this opening 
to awareness. Every time we get caught up in thoughts or memories or images, we can almost feel or imagine a sense of leaning back, returning to this preference of silence, settling back into stillness, and see if there's maybe even a bit of relief with that homecoming. all the noise and the movement outside. Gives us this opportunity to practice and see if we can still connect to that sense of silence inside. And feel and imagine a quality of light in the body, Sambhogakaya, body of light. It's our awareness of the light that's already within us, the sense of vitality, presence. And then feeling and imagining this shifting and opening to the warmth. Almost like when the sun rises over the horizon, the beginning of the day, and we feel that warmth. Feel and imagine our mind, warm, spacious, able to contain everything. Reconnecting to the two elements of our posture, uprightness of the spine, total ease. And maintaining just the simplest semblance of posture as we open and open and open towards the sense of warmth in the mind in which sounds can arise, thoughts can arise, we just make more space around whatever arises.
A couple more moments to continue coming back. Feeling this quality of warmth and openness, the mind settled in its natural state. Nirmanakaya, body of manifestation, fully present and here. And feel the interweaving of these qualities, stillness, silence, openness. And then considering and imagining this quality of wind, air, movement. Here in San Francisco, we have so much wind moving the leaves and the branches and the trees, tossing around the flowers, the grasses in the spring. See if you can, in your mind's eye, really bring forth an image of the wind and its playfulness, its capacity for change, movement. Maybe you can imagine the wind on the top of the water moving the waves. Or the wind in a park, on a mountain. So much strength. Sometimes we shy away from the wind, or it makes us feel chilled or uncomfortable. But really focus on that quality of wind that has that playfulness, that movement, that possibility for things to really be shifted and changed. As we imagine this in our mind's eye, we Imagine feeling or inviting that quality within us, that movement, that possibility of change, shifting, feeling this essence of wind here. If it's hard to feel and imagine, no problem. Just keep as a practice, imagining, inviting this quality. And if you notice some presence of wind, really check it out and see how it manifests and shows up in the body, the heart, and the mind. What is this wind energy quality within us? Sometimes our wind energy internally can be too high. We're agitated and distracted. But when it's balanced, we really can have this sense of motivation, movement, possibility of change. And then feel and imagine a sense of releasing this visualization of wind, allowing the sense in the body to subside, and just returning to the breath, gently following the inhale and exhale.
do for your practice? Boy, we had some help out there, huh? <laughs> for friends online, we had, uh, what was that? Uh, I think they were keeping the door back on the Boeing plane. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there was some, it sounded to me kind of like a low level jackhammer. Oh, I thought it was Muni related in some way. <laughs> anyway, right in the silence portion, it was very timely. So. Questions or reflections on that practice? For folks here, if they don't mind using the mic so friends at home can hear. Any thoughts, questions, or reflections on that practice? Mm hmm. Yes, please. Yeah, I was just wondering what um, you're talking about, like a like a balanced wind. I was I was wondering what what you kind of like. Is there a visualization for that, or a, a temperature to sort of mm. think about, or a way? I don't know. I mean, I was kind of thinking about like vortexes, but you know, like you know, when you yeah. see like a little yeah. It's kind of like a its own little equilibrium. Yeah. But um, how did it feel for you? If you don't let me ask. Or like, could you feel any sense of that quality, wind? Um, I it's just always nice when I see like a little swirl kind of pop up and mm -hmm. dance around, you know, yeah. in a field or whatever. But it's yeah. not really an equal. I don't know. So I, I just yeah. that's what I was visualizing, and I and I was just wondering if there's any any sort of guide around that. Yeah. Um, yeah good it question. felt nice but i don't know yeah good well <laughs> i think that's good i mean it is i i think wind is a is a little tricky um or air really is uh is the quality compared to earth it's like okay fire yeah water very clear this one is a little bit trickier to kind of visualize and invite that quality in and i'll talk a little bit more about wind or air but it, it's pretty interesting um, for folks who know Tibetan medicine and also traditional Chinese medicine. A lot of the disorders are, are lung disorders or wind disorders. Too much wind energy. I feel like that's what I've heard so many <laughs> of my Tibetan teachers. Are like, Too much wind energy. Uh, it pretty much describes all things like agitated, stressed out, depleted, like, like it's really an imbalanced overabundance of wind. And it's, it's so interesting because um, I'm a dork like that. I was reading all these papers that are uh, integrative medicine and complementary medicine approaches trying to describe what our lung means in modern science and autonomic nervous system terms. And there's not a direct equivalent. <clears throat> you know, so much of the diagnostic process of um, Tibetan medicine and <clears throat> other medicines uses these different qualities um, than we do in contemporary Western medicine. And, and wind is such a, like a primary, it's one of the three primaries and this overabundance. And I know what that feels like. And, and over the years being on retreat and uh, receiving teachings, I do feel like I can tell when someone has too much wind energy now on retreat, especially, and it's just this kind of over agitated sense. And that's a little different here than kind of calling in the quality of wind. But when it is um, out of balance, there is, uh, so if there's too little, you feel stuck, a lack of flow, that you're not progressing or expanding and that your relationships are not deepening. If there's too much, you have trouble sticking to things, you feel lack of satisfaction with what you're doing um, and you're easily tossed about by external circumstances. Um, but the idea is when you're in balance, you feel flexible, free moving, healing, lively, fresh, light, magical, transformative, communicative. But again, those are all descriptive words. I, I really see or kind of imagine that quality 
like on the side of a mountain where the wind is just like coming so hard. And it really is, it's like creating a different view of the landscape. Like it shifts everything. And when you watch the wind on water, just so incredible, right? It can come from so many different directions and it moves everything and it shapes everything. And for those of us who are ocean lovers and we like our ocean a certain way, wind is not really our friend. Like if it's windy out, there's no surf, not good, right? Um, took me a long time to develop a more appreciative relationship with the wind because it does, it has that disturbing quality at times. Like you're like, oh, like I wish it wasn't windy out. I think I've said that to myself, being a local San Franciscan, like millions of times. <laughs> like, oh, it'd be so nice out if it wasn't so windy, right? So I get that it's not necessarily the easiest quality for us to, to say, yeah, I like it. So I, I like that idea of a little, I don't even know what you call those, those little wind, um, did you call it a vortex? I don't even know what you might Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, those little, little things. Mm -hmm. but, and I mean, like a, a light off door, you know, I mean, that's, that's like, that's true. I shouldn't, I should say not an onshore wind is what we don't like. You know? Don't like the onshore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's true when it goes over the, so yeah, it's, it's quite beautiful. Um, you open up the door in like a hot yoga class and there's just like. <laughs> <laughs> Post yoga wind, we also. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, now that I, I guess I can talk about it. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Anybody else? Other questions or thoughts either on the three precious pills or on wind air energy yes please could we get yes thank you if everything is clean here inside mm. like it all, something went in yeah and cleaned everything mm. And I feel a lot of space. <laughs> That's great. Hmm. And no pain and no nothing. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. The kind of, yeah, because I, I, I especially think those three precious pills, when you can land in them, they do have that quality of kind of clearing us out. Mm -hmm. And again, not in a, um, not in a way that we just feel dull and blah, but like that vividness and brightness. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Anybody else? Other questions? Reflections on the practice? I think we'll probably do a week or two more of these three precious pills. And I know we've been doing it now a couple months. Just curious if it's evolving for folks in certain ways. Yeah. I still think that, that that silence is pretty tough. Anybody else? I, I mean, especially today, maybe. But I, I think it's a really interesting one because when you get into that sense of silence can open you into infinite awareness, I feel as though we're almost all the way at that spaciousness and openness and warmth too. Like it's hard to keep it <clears throat> into one place at a time. And I think that's okay. I think it's nice for them to be cumulative. Very often you'll hear teachers, you know, just really simply say, settle body, speech, and mind in its natural state. And that's it. You have like a two minute introduction and then you move on to the meditation. So to spend this much time settling those uh, qualities is, I do think it's a, it's a good gift to ourselves to really get that sense of establishing ourself in practice. <clears throat> Though not always easy. Any other questions, comments, please? Thank you, yes. Helps get your steps in for the day. Yeah, thanks for the steps. Um, no, almost like I think um, this reflection for me, uh, the stillness and the silence, it was almost like when I was in one, the other one was easier. So it's like a jinxing mm -hmm. effect, like, mm -hmm. oh, stillness. Oh, oh, so, 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 oh no, it's so hard now. Yeah. But then silence. Oh, now the stillness is easy. Yeah. Okay, cool. And now that it's mm -hmm. done, there's a... Any additional yeah tricks or just you know do it more. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I do think they really can start feeling like they emerge from one another. And then I do love, he really does instruct us at the end to feel them together. And I think, you know, in, in moving forward with these practices, maybe spending a little less time and letting them feel a little more mixed together is great. Yeah. And curious, did anybody resonate with the with the Dharmakaya, with the Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya? Did that add anything or just sound kind of nice? Maybe confusing? I like relating that to the, like learning about what those mean. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It would be nice to get a little deeper on, on those. It's... <laughs> It gets a little bit, you know, there, it gets very, it can get a little complicated quickly, but when we are doing meditation practice, essentially a lot of our practices help us with what's called the subtle body. We talk about here often, and it's the sense of the body. That's not just the form body and the sense of the body that, um, you know, you could say it's where our energy, our emotions, where a lot is coursing through us, but it also, when our subtle body feels open, there's all these channels and different uh, pathways in the subtle body you see illustrated. Actually, Alex Gray, you know, many know the psychedelic artist, he has like beautiful subtle body um, images where you just see everything kind of like lit up. Then you can feel that in practice, like that the whole body starts, it's almost as though you have more access to sensations throughout the body. And that sensation makes your body feel more spacious. And so when we think of these different bodies, we're looking at the different layers and levels that we can experience in the subtle body. It's just beautiful. I'm, I'm very confident modern science will catch up. But currently, you know, we look at form body and then we kind of look at uh, the way that, you know, stress gets under the skin, which is kind of this more nuanced level of how the body responds to psychological or mental phenomena but we don't have really a way to describe or test subtle body quite yet the field of bioenergetics is still growing but you don't really need that you just need your own first person experience of the bodies or the body becoming more attuned awake alive and often the first sign of that is the body just feels a little bigger, like less confined to this. It feels like we have more space or energy in the body. Oh. Yeah, Jimmy. You may have a raised hand. Okay, is that Claudia? Yep. Yep. Did you get a haircut? <laughs> yeah, really short. <laughs> and I just came back from Mexico, I have to tell you. I just landed today in San Francisco. Oh my Francisco. gosh, welcome back. Thank you, thank you. But, um. I was looking at my notes on um, uh, uh, Tenzin's conference, and I'm I'm I really would like you to elaborate on something that wasn't quite as clear to me. Uh, I see here that he's talking about pay, pain identity, and he says yeah. all the teachings are about finding and knowing oneself. We have roles in society, but that's not us. We're no one. And then he says. When we're no one, we have the power to be everyone. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. I am glad you picked up on, on that. I thought that was a very beautiful proclamation that he made. You know, this idea that when we, so the, the pain identity that, um, that Rinpoche talks about is essentially the ways that we contract with a sense of who we are and who we aren't right? Like that, all those ways that we create so much unnecessary suffering. I should be like that. I shouldn't be like that. And it like, it has the effect of, you know, I just talked about the subtle body making us feel more open. It's like the opposite of that. When we feel more contracted and we could talk about that as anxiety, insecurity, self-doubt, insufficiency, all that is like contracting us. And it's also solidifying us, right? If we really have self-doubt, insecurity, anxiety, we're very certain that we are this certain way. Like we are, you know, I'm bad at that. I'm not as good as that as I should be. Like it's this very fixed sense of self. 
And it's so funny is when we have, especially that like deficiency mindset of I'm not enough, it's not good, that pain, he calls the pain identity. We're so self-absorbed, but we're self-absorbed with how bad we are. <laughs> it's not the self-absorbed with I'm so awesome. And so when we kind of loosen that, when we're not as preoccupied with how not great we are, then we're getting closer to that. Well, then if I'm, you know, if I don't need to worry about not being enough, then I can just be what I am in this moment. Hmm. I'm less preoccupied with this Eve Ekman project of being someone and doing something. So it's not no one as in I cease to be me. I still have an essence of me. It's just, I'm less preoccupied, less of my energy is being donated to this project of who I think I'm not. Um, and it's, you know, I love that he calls it the pain identity. So most of our identity projects are pretty like <laughs> uncomfortable. Uh, Ram Dass says, you know, his, his, his identity was like a shoe that didn't fit, you know, and that when he started practicing, it's like taking off these uncomfortable, too tight shoes. Such a good like uh, metaphor, you know, when in too tight of a shoes, you just can't move, you can't do anything. So you're kind of kicking off those too tight of shoes when you become no one. And I love the eloquence of no one, but it doesn't really mean like that I no longer have a driver's license or a home, right? It just means I'm not so preoccupied. And whenever we are kind of more simple, I like of just thinking it, instead of saying I'm no one, I'm just more simple. It's so clear how connected we all are. Just in that same way, when we're not preoccupied with what's wrong in our life or what's wrong uh, with ourselves, we can be more available to the suffering of others yeah, exactly that and to right. how it's like us, mm -hmm. right? Or the goodness of others and how it's like us. We kind of break that duality that keeps us so separate and so isolated and uncertain. Right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good question. Great. Any other thoughts, reflections on that or being no one? It's a good aspiration. It's um, it's an everyday project. You know, it's this is why and uh, Rinpoche is so interested in in sleep these days. But he's actually really long time interest in in dreams. And there's such a cool, I mean, we, every single day we experience being no one twice, but we usually don't remember it as we are falling into the bardo of sleep. And as we're returning to like the waking life, we go, we kind of fall into being no one and we come out um, of sleep into this kind of con consensual reality <laughs> that we live in. Um, yeah. And I think that especially that, Phase and stage before sleep is a really interesting one to explore if we can extend it at all. Uh, I know some of you were here when Ryan Redmond taught a couple weeks back and he got like really heavy into the, the dharma of, of not being and how we dissolve through the elements at death, which is um, a practice you can do. And I, I do think it's a good idea to practice it quite a lot of imagining what it will be like to let go of everything that we consider who we are when necessarily all of us will transition from life until dying. So it's a, that's another practice of becoming no one too. So I'm going to read a little bit more about the air element here. Um, so he says again that too much air indicates that there's too little earth or water so if we remember that when we're getting too much of that wind or air activity, we aren't feeling that sense of groundedness. We're not uh, feeling that sense of kind of fluidity that we do in water. And I think the way he describes this too much air, it's just you cannot be satisfied with what you're experiencing. This is why I think I hear you hear about Lung so much in um, kind of contemporary modern culture from wisdom teachers. And they say people just, it's like never enough, right? I'm not satisfied. And some of you know may, may know the term dukkha, which is often translated as suffering. But another translation is dissatisfaction. And that's like hits the nail on the head for most of us, right? Some people like 
won't identify as I'm suffering on a day-to-day -day basis, but the suffering of dissatisfaction, right? Of just, I don't like, I want it to be like this. I don't like it like that. And the, how that keeps us kind of trapped always of, I need to have, you know, this thing to be a little better and then I'd be satisfied. And it kind of typifies that um, endless cycle of samsara and looking for a sense of satisfaction and trying to experience it out there instead of in here. And then he goes in a little deeper to, oh yeah, um, to the wind element. And it's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of beauty. I'm sure everybody here has seen a prayer flag at some point. They might not even realize they're connected to Buddhist practice. <laughs> like so prevalent now as decorations. Um, but the, the prayer flags actually like use wind to spread blessings, right? And often on the prayer flags, you'll see the wind horse. So it's an image of a horse. And that really represents a life force within us. So the wind element is like also a lot about just our basic life force. Um, so he says, if you've been feeling stuck and are in need of this air element, you can seek out a windy location. We're totally in luck here. It's like, <laughs> go to a spot where people fly kites, consider a high point such as a hilltop mountain pass or visit the beach. Um, and connect with it anywhere. And it's interesting, and he says it's it's really different to be next to an element or on an element and be aware when you're with the element. And we talked a bit about how mm, we can have a deep relationship to, let's say, earth element. We run on a trail every day, but we're not really aware of earth element. It's this transactional relationship. So when we develop, you know, this you know, ongoing relating to the natural world, we're doing so almost instead of like, I, it, it's like, I, thou, it's a very Martin Buber approach of this, like me is sacred and has its own wisdom qualities. And I'm curious. So imagine if we felt the way we do towards everyone we respect towards these natural qualities of the world, that's the kind of relationship. So not just going somewhere windy and being bummed, <laughs> right? Or getting into the windbreaker and being like, oh, I got to find somewhere. But really like seeing, meeting, honoring, noticing that quality. He says, um, it's a Tibetan tradition to toss thin papers containing prayers into the breeze and imagining that the air disperses the prayers throughout the universe. And the purpose of this is to raise your wind horse, your life force a mythical Tibetan creature. The wind horse symbolizes the space element, the subtle energy of inner air. It brings good fortune, ensuring every circumstance you meet will lead to your success and well-being. As the wind lifts prayers to the sky, your inner wind raises your energy. You can explore this connection between outer and inner winds in your practice. The more you connect with wind element and merge with its qualities, the more flexible and resilient you will be. You will feel yourself opening to new perspectives and will sense your potential for expansion and growth. <clears throat> if you've been lacking energy or vitality, you are in need of the fire, right? So the there's like this relationship a bit with the wind and the fire, because of course the wind can accentuate the fire, right? The wind is this accelerant in some ways to these different elements. And <clears throat> I really appreciate how he invites us to make the date with nature in this explicit way in order to bring it into our practice. And I think ideally, a lot of these practices in our in this book, I think the three precious pills, you could do that every day in your practice. But I think retrieving from the elements, like we learn about it, we try it out, we go out to the natural world and see how that feels. And then it's almost like having aspirin on the shelf in your bathroom where you have this certain like, oh, I'm so stuck. God, I'm so dissatisfied. And then we kind of call upon one of these elements. We invite it in. And it also, of course, is really interesting to practice in the natural world if we can and start to really feel that element within us. And then we could seek it out. But the idea isn't exactly that 
we need it from the natural world. It's that the natural world helps us see it reflected within us, right? So just in the way that there's a very classic practice uh, where you gaze at the face of the Buddha, right? And you imagine his wisdom qualities and you imagine them in you. There's kind of a similar resonance where you're experiencing this quality of change and playfulness in the wind and then imagining it in you. And it's interesting when I first started practicing, I really struggled with this uh, Buddha reverence as a longtime atheist. And I was like, I don't know if I want to revere this guy, you know, like he's just a guy, like too much re reverence. And it was very uh, anti the reverence. And so instead of gazing at the face of the Buddha to feel those qualities, I would do that at sunset. Mm -hmm. And I felt that, oh yeah, just like the sunset, there's this warmth and beauty that's changing. There's warmth and beauty and changing in here. And so this idea of like, how can we feel that resonance and that beauty? Because, you know, what Rinpoche was saying, and which I think is, is really um, essential medicine, is all of these practices, it's like they're just dusting the stairs so that we can come into this inner temple where the source of everything that is the goodness we seek lies. Mm -hmm. And I love that he used that word like source, right? That's not a word you often hear <laughs> teachers use necessarily, right? You kind of hear that in more colloquial culture and like, I got to get in touch with source. But he really used that like you are the internal source you're looking for. And it gets back to this idea and uh, Chogyam Trumpa describes our basic goodness. You know, if you don't, if it's hard for you to believe that you are already a Buddha or a Buddha on the way to enlightenment, you might be able to believe that you're basically good and basically okay. And that instead of, you know, seeking and comparing and, you know, engaging with the world outside in this very transactional relationship, that we can kind of relate to the world from a place where we have that sense of fundamental goodness. Like I'm already good and yeah, you know, on my way to learning more and being more. And we had this kind of great exchange last time I was here around like acceptance and like you're practicing like your hair is on fire. And like, how do we, how do we reconcile both of those? And we were talking before the session that I think, I really think they can coexist well. I don't think you can practice like your hair on fire if you don't believe you're already good because it'll become kind of neurotic. It'll become like striving. So there has to be this full acceptance. And I think acceptance is another way of saying, I'm basically good. So all that shit I did and I hurt others and I didn't mean to, and all the ways I wish I could have shown up better, still I'm basically good. And once you're basically good and in recognition of that, the only thing that makes sense is to practice like your hair is on fire. Because it's the greatest good you can do for yourself and others. So I think they they go well hand in hand. All right. Let's settle our wind energies. Yeah, and take a moment and reconnect to the breath and the body. And feel and imagine that sense of vital energy that was within us, this wind force of life. And if it's comfortable, placing hands together in front of the chest as a symbolic offering of our time here together and consider dedicating our time, energy, and effort into this world which so deeply needs a sense of belonging and love, imagining that all beings could experience ease and peace, safety and comfort, that each and every being could be free.
Thanks, everyone. I think we have some announcements mm -hmm. from Mace. 